thanks for tuning in to Telecast. Each week, we speak with TV's movers and shakers to get the latest insight and opinion on industry developments. There's a new episode every Thursday. Our website, telecast.com, includes additional exclusive feature content from TV's thought leaders. Articles are free to read. Just register on telecast.com. And while you're there, why not sign up for our free newsletter, Telecast Plus? Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoy the show. Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to Telecast. On this week's show, I'm chatting with Anthony Laser, VP of Content Partnerships and Programming at Comcast's US fast channel platform, Zumo. We're discussing what makes a great fast channel and what he's looking to acquire for Zumo. Plus, I catch up with Lucy Smith, director of MIP TV and MIPCOM, as we look ahead to this year's April event in Cannes, the first for three years. We'll find out what delegates can expect from this year's event, who's already signed up to be on the Quasset, and what industry heavyweights will be in attendance at one of the first major post-pandemic international TV market events. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. My first guest this week is Anthony Laser, Vice President of Content Partnerships and Programming at Comcast-owned US fast channel, Zumo. Welcome to the show, Anthony. Thanks so much for having me, Justin. Great to speak to you. You're in LA right now, is that right? I used to live in LA, actually, uh, but during the pandemic, I relocated with my family. I'm actually in a small town about halfway in between uh, Philadelphia and New York City. How's the weather for you? Because did I, did I see you got a bit of a snow, actually, last uh, few yeah. weeks ago. Are you, uh, is is yeah. it melted? Is it gone? Are you uh, able to move around? I can see my, my uh, backyard from right, right where I'm seated right now, and it is just still a blanket of, of, of snow. Uh, so, yeah, very nostalgic for, for my days in Los Angeles at the moment, especially when I'm shoveling the driveway. To begin with, Anthony, tell us about Zumo, because I came across Zumo a couple of weeks ago. For the benefit of our listeners who maybe aren't aware of uh, Zumo, can you tell us about the channel and its story to date? Yeah, so Zumo is a platform that was incubated by Panasonic in the early uh, 2010s. Uh, I, I came to the company in 2017, and at that point, Zumo had just recently put a deal together with LG so that all LG smart TVs would have what's called LG channels powered by Zumo. Now, Zumo had already been a platform that you could find on places like Roku or Amazon Fire. But what was uh, critical in 2017 and what really attracted me to the company was that it solved for this issue of how do you break out uh, from all of these thousands of apps? You know, for instance, Roku, you know, there was, I think uh, in 2017, there was a few thousand apps that you could potentially download, but most users only downloaded three or four, you know, Netflix, Hulu, whatever the household uh, you know, the household brand name apps were, those were the ones that got downloaded. And so it, I was wondering, you know, thinking about how do you break through all that noise to become, to get in front of a user. And the LG deal that our, our COO at that time, uh, a, a gentleman named Jiro Agawa had made, the deal he had made, made total sense to me the the Zumo platform would be natively available on LG TVs. LG is going to be out there in the in the marketplace marketing these TVs, selling them at all these stores and and Zumo would be pre-populated when those users purchased that TV. And so that made a lot of sense to me and 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 Zumo continued to build out its footprint by doing that by being natively available uh, on smart TVs and on devices. And I think that was one of the reasons why Comcast was interested 
in Zumo. Uh, there was a, obviously a lot of interest in the fast space in 2019 and 2020. And, you know, we were acquired by Comcast in March of 2020. After uh, those uh, early years of, of, like I said, you know, trying to make strategic deals with device manufacturers to get to get Zumo out there. And I imagine Comcast was looking at uh, the popularity of streaming during the pandemic, right? Because that sits right in the middle of or after the the first wave, I think it was or so. So uh... we got acquired and then the pandemic shutdowns began right after we were acquired. Um, so that's how the timing worked there. I think, you know, uh, what was happening in the, in the fast acquisition space was that the first big acquisition was Pluto TV by Viacom. And I think some of the other major uh, companies and device manufacturers uh, started also then at that time building their own platform. So Roku built the Roku channel and, uh, uh, Amazon created IMDB TV, um, and then some of the other TV manufacturers really started building out their platforms like Samsung TV Plus and Vizio Watch Free. This all happened in you know the 2019, around that time. Uh, Zumo was then acquired by Comcast in early 2020, as was Tubi by, by Fox. You know, that's, you know, how some of the alignments happen with the these bigger companies and, and their fast platforms. You know, now we're sort of in this new evolution where some of these platforms are doing things like commissioning original content, creating exclusive linear channels, um, working with, you know, what used to be primarily MVPD media companies, you know, the A&E's the AMCs who were creating cable channels previously have now started shifting where a bigger and bigger part of their focus is their fast channel offering. That makes uh, complete sense. I can see how the the giants have all coalesced and, you know, and and seen the opportunity in fast and made their, made their acquisitions. I guess now the challenge is for everybody is not only discovery and you you mentioned that was one of the reasons why you were first attracted to Zumo in the first place one thing for me is is that I'm always struggling to to understand is um uh, you know you need a USP in anything don't you in terms of making your product or service stand out against competition first of all tell us how it's distributed so there's all the sort of standard ways you can get Zumo like any other app, which is downloading that app on your Amazon Fire Stick or Apple TV or Roku or whatever. Then there are the native integrations on devices. So uh, there are smart TVs where Zumo is natively available. Uh, early on, we did things like we'd make a deal with Vizio where we would have a Zumo branded physical button on the remote. So there were different ways where you would integrate with a a device. There's those sort of distribution points, you know, being natively available on a a smart TV. And then there's really our, our sort of core, which is how we're integrated on Comcast devices. So there's the X1 cable box, the main device, Comcast cable subscribers receive that device. And then if you're a broadband household, if you don't have cable, then you would get a flex box, which is sort of the shorthand is it's similar to like a Roku box. Households get those. And then there is this new X-Class TV, which is a Comcast powered television that has a Comcast powered operating system. Zumo is natively available there as well. So that's really how you would get that. And we're primarily in the United States. We've done some work as a a solution outside the United States, but that's really a a smaller audience at the, at the moment, you know, the, the bread and butter and and majority of the audience is, is in the United States. Right. Okay. And can you disclose how many subscribers or how many people are are watching Zumo on a regular basis? You know, Comcast asks us not to do that, actually. So I, I, I can't. There, there certainly, um, if you, you do a little research, there has been 
and certainly articles written that, you know, indicate that or point to that. But yeah, yeah, that's something that uh, I, I'm not able to disclose uh, publicly. So in terms of Zumo as a brand then, and as a platform, what would you say, other than its distribution, what is the content that is really driving take up at the moment? What sort of programming is really working well? A lot of times, you know, it, it's similar to traditional TV, but really in the fast space, I'll, I'll point to a, a couple of verticals. One is true crime. So true crime, documentaries, detective series, crime related content performs very strong. One of our top house channels is the Zumo Crime channel, which is an aggregation of true crime TV from various content partners. So crime tends to do really well, either in in an aggregation of crime content, or there's what we call single series channels. So a true crime single series channel on our platform, one would be that I would point to would be Forensic Files. So this is a series that's been on for years and years and years on traditional cable TV. Uh, It gets cobbled together in the fast space into a single series forensic files branded linear channel. We also have VOD capability on our platform and that's a very successful channel. It checks off a couple different boxes and that it's a well-known single series and it fits the crime vertical. One thing in the, in, in the U.S., I know it's not as popular internationally, that's an interesting genre that tends to also perform really well is the Western. So this could be Western movies, Western old classic Western TV series. It always was surprising to me as we started, you know, really building out kind of our footprint of various, you know, distributors when I would see Western content start to take off in terms of engagement time. But, uh, you know, it makes sense. It's, you know, a lot of this is is people looking for comfort TV and, and looking to find something they're familiar with. And they often return to those channels at a high frequency and leave those channels on for long periods of time and create uh, significant engagement. And so Western is actually a surprising genre to me all the time and, and how well it performs. And then there's some of the obvious sort of servicey types of channels, news, weather, sports, uh, we find, again, create return usage, with, which is key, and longer and longer engagement times. That's interesting, actually, because, I mean, when you said true crime, that isn't a surprise to me, because on many times on, on telecast, we've been uh, speaking to various channels and uh, channel owners and discussing, and true crime seems to go from strength to strength. There's like an global insatiable appetite for this content and that's the sort of content that it's almost like horror i suppose in a way you know it's like living vicariously to through somebody else i suppose um and that sort of shock factor but then at the other end of the scale you said about comfort tv so it's interesting actually it seems like opposite ends of the scale this sort of content still works across zoomer there is often a difference by device so in terms of what a user will will watch and what we can generally glean from the data. So for instance, if you have a native integration on a high-end television, there will be a different set of high engagement channels. Now there will be some overlap, but there is certainly a, a very different audience from a 50-inch TV that costs 700 to $800 versus one that costs $200 or $300. That's always a challenge for a a programmer like myself is trying to find, you know, a way to balance what can often be uh, an audience that changes significantly from one distribution point to the next. I hadn't even considered that. It's completely different demographics watching the same platform depending on on, on the device that they're watching. How do you program for that? Can you have almost limitless channels on there? So you're actually catering for everybody? We're, we're at roughly 250 channels on the Zumo platform. You know, some of the others in the space have significantly more. I think um, 
Pluto's well over 300 channels. I think we're most comfortable where we're at, at about 250. And, and that breadth of channels, you can, you know, cater to even some very niche audiences. It's important to remember, like, you don't need to have a massive audience for every channel to make it successful. What you need to have is a core return user base. And so I think it allows for us to do some interesting niche programming because even though the total users may be relatively small, if they're creating long engagement times, they're creating impactful revenue because long engagement times mean more ads can populate. So, for example, I mean, we had Royalty TV on a few uh, a few months ago. So royal programming around the world, that would sit right slap bang in the middle of what I would imagine Zumo is looking for. That would be a sort of a perfect example of passionate niche programming. Yes. I often have these conversations with media companies that are looking to bring their library together into various fast channel offerings. You know, they come to us often with a very general idea. And what I try and convey is that the more it could be for anyone, the less it's for any specific audience. For instance, we have a general movie channel, Zumo Free Movies, and we have it broken down other channels into house channels that are verticalized. If you have that same movie programmed in a general channel and say in the action channel, it's an action movie, that movie will tend to have double, at least double the engagement time on the action movie channel than on the general movie channel. So it's really important to to telegraph to the user exactly what this channel is about, to brand it explicitly so that when that user sees that channel branding, they know what they're getting as opposed to making it general and increasing the chance that there's going to be a channel surfing sort of behavior uh, going on. And you want to even winnow to a point, you know, one of the most successful programming strategies in this space, um, and it goes over into traditional TV as well, is the the single series channel. Uh, Basically, you know, uh, it, it, it's narrowing to a point that you're watching one series. So let's take, uh, Gordon Ramsay. There's a Hell's Kitchen, uh, very popular Hell's Kitchen single series channel that most platforms in the space carry. And why is that? Because everyone knows exactly what it is. Uh, they know it's Gordon Ramsay yelling at someone in, in, in a kitchen. And so that channel, um, you know, it's a series that has enough episodes to give it varied programming. And it has a a series brand that has been marketed heavily. So everybody knows what it is. It has a recognizable talent connected to it. So all of those things come together into a very successful channel, despite the fact that it doesn't have a really ornate programming. What we're talking about is one series and it doesn't even particularly matter how much you sort that series in terms of the sequencing because it's not like it has a story arc or anything. So that's an example, I think, of getting back to the original point of having a very specific channel concept is a much better strategy than trying a general channel where you're uh, aggregating a lot of various different types of content. So for our listeners out there who may have some series brands out there, how many hours? Let's say there is a true crime brand that a (laughs) producer has there or a producer distributor has. How many hours do you need to make a, a channel successful on Zuma? Yeah, I think it depends on what you're looking to do. I mean, there's certainly we have a couple different ways we approach this. One is to do if you have, say, it's a, a, sh- a, a smaller amount of total hours. So say you're below 100 hours, say you have 60 or 70 at a minimum, you could pop up that channel 
uh, and and not have a particularly particularly high bounce rate for probably 90 days, maybe even a little bit further than that. I think if you're going to try and do, you know, 12 months at least, you're going to want to start with, you know, 100 to 150 hours and then maybe do some refreshing quarterly or at least every six months. I certainly tend to see bounce rate go up on channels uh, that are statically programmed for more than six months. And you say it's predominantly distributed in the uh, in the US at the moment. What about foreign language content? I probably know the answers to this already, but the reason why I'm asking is that obviously there's a huge Hispanic audience in the US. Mm-hmm. And do you find that Spanish language content works for a particular audience? Or is the distribution in place to an extent now where there's a mass of Hispanic viewers or an Hispanic audience to make it worthwhile having channels. The other thing is that, you know, seeing how fast is growing in popularity around the world and the way SVOD is changing things in terms of local content going global, for example, could you ever see it having a Korean channel? So currently we have a Latino vertical that has all Spanish language content and it's it's some of the major media companies uh, that you would imagine, you know, um, Telemundo uh, has multiple channels on our service, Estrella uh, TV. We see that audience growing quickly. At first, you know, we had only a handful of, of Spanish language channels, but as we built out the offering, we have, I believe, 10 Uh, Spanish language channels now, we certainly have found that audience uh, continuing to grow and continuing to create longer and longer engagement time. So we're bullish on Spanish language content in the US. You know, we have a a handful of international channels. We have content from Africa, content from Korea, uh, content from China. So we do have some international content. And and I'm not sure exactly about other platforms in the space. I do think it's a little bit trickier in the fast space than in an SVOD space to get the users to read subtitles. It's a bummer. Uh, Some of my favorite content, you know, is is not. Uh, produced in the United States and is not in, in English language. You know, certainly we've all saw the popularity of things like Squid Game and, you know, the movie Parasite. And uh, obviously there's a lot of Spanish language content that that I think, you know, is becoming extremely popular in the United States. However, for me personally, when I look at the data, I certainly see that the that users will in at times more quickly move on from uh subtitled content uh, it it does not create this on average the same uh, engagement times that content in the local language does and so one th- one platform that uh, i've seen this uh, clearly outside of the United States as well is in Brazil. Um, we've done some work with LG in Brazil for the LG channels integration there. Having content that is subtitled in, in Brazilian Portuguese, it just does not perform anywhere close to content that's been dubbed into Brazilian Portuguese. So that's one place where I've seen a lot of data that points to the need to dub into the local language uh, to get the highest impact from your content. Can you tell us a little bit more about your role and your responsibilities there? I mean, are you looking for fresh content and you're presumably looking to drive engagement and get the best possible content for Zumo? There's two different ways that my personal role sort sort of looks to, to, to program. One is working with Uh, media companies that have channel concepts. So looking to create the best channel lineup that we can potentially create. And that's through doing acquisitions of uh, and partnerships for entire channel properties. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is what we specifically license for the Zumo branded house channels. So those are 20 
movie and TV verticalized channels that we do licensing around. Uh, and then I iterate on a programming strategy to create the highest amount of engagement for those channels. Uh, a lot of that content, you know, tends to be what you license from movie studios. Uh, uh, you know, it's a little bit more traditional licensing where they don't really, you know, have a fast strategy per se. It's more, here's the window of you, you can license this movie from this time to this time um, for X dollars. So that's how the sort of the, my, my role is sort of bifurcated is in between um, working with partners who have, you know, channel concepts and then working with partners who just supply us with, with, with content for our house channels. What content are you looking for? Because I can imagine when it comes to the show channels, if you like, that, that you were mentioning, I'm assuming most of your discussions are with the big distribution businesses in the US and around the world. I'm trying to look at the, you know, what's the opportunity for maybe the smaller businesses that may have amazing content and they're looking at ways to monetize them and take them to wider audiences. What's the opportunity there for like a medium size, let's say a UK producer that has that has English language content, how could their content potentially fit into your own channels and how do they get in touch with you? I can speak generally kind of to how the space is moving. I, I mentioned a little bit earlier that some platforms are moving into original content. You know, we've started licensing uh, and commissioning original content in the very early stages. There are certainly platforms that are way beyond. For instance, I look at Tubi in the U US and Tubi is always announcing uh, new originals. Um, you know, the, the Roku channel, for instance, purchases uh, libraries. Uh, you know, I think uh, IMDB TV and Amazon, I think they purchased um, the MGM library. So there are uh, certainly fast platforms that are, have, you know, moved into buying originals and buying libraries far beyond where, where Zumo's at at this point. Um, but what I would say is we, like others in the space, are looking for interesting differentiating content. Um, what I mean by that is to do potentially exclusives, to do first to fast windows. Certainly, uh, I think to look for ways to, to make the house channels part of the marketing effort around the platform. You know, you want your Zumo action movie channel to reflect well on Zumo. And so you're looking for interesting, original, or exclusive content to establish that. One of the things that I, I've seen a lot of platforms do, you know, that we look into, for instance, is holiday programming. So Tubi uh, was really good about this in 2021. They purchased uh, a lot of different timely Christmas-related and holiday-related titles. Those sort of efforts work in this space because timely marketing is impactful. The audiences are looking for specific types of programming at specific times of the year. And then further, it's uh, marketing those assets is a, a big part of it. And, and getting discovery to occur and users to discover that content is interesting with a timely hook and effective with a timely hook. So certainly when, you know, I guess getting back to your original question, yeah, I think we, we everybody in the space is looking for interesting originals that could potentially be thought of w with, a, with a strong marketing angle. Uh, I would mention that. I think the other thing that we look at because of the way the fast space is, is what can be compiled together into a channel. And that's why deep single series are very interesting uh, is because um, if you have the, like, let's use Hell's Kitchen as an example. If you're the only one who has the Hell's Kitchen channel, then the the devoted fan base of that uh, series uh, will, you know, obviously find your platform. Pluto was acquired by Viacom. Um, they utilize a huge portion of their channel lineup on single series channel concepts from the Viacom vault. 
Um, so it's not just Zumo uh, and some of the others. It's it's it, the single series focus uh, is is pervasive as a programming strategy across the space. And my second part of that question was, how do people get in touch with you? Now, you tend to be at markets. Will we see you at, uh, at MIP TV, which is coming up in uh, in a few weeks' time? It's come around quite quickly. And obviously, it's the first MIP TV for, for three years. Will we see you there? I, I would like to, uh, to make it there. We, you know, we're being part of a larger corporate organization like Comcast. You know, there are certain... Uh, travel restrictions um, that have occurred throughout the pandemic. So we, we're still working on confirming. But in general, yes, we're at these markets. We we, we were planning to be at NatP uh, before that got canceled in Miami in January. So we're looking forward to getting back out to the markets, to, to meeting with folks about their projects. Again, I, I certainly am looking forward to resuming travel in general, during the without the the markets in, over the last couple of years during the uh, the pandemic, what usually occurs is a, a media company or producer distributor will will reach out via email and and they'll have avails uh, or or a channel proposal concept and we'll we'll discuss that and um, you know we have an ongoing internal uh, channel proposal tracker that we kind of look to, I look at daily in terms of where the pipeline's going uh, and where the channel lineup's going. So I, I certainly spend a lot of my days, you know, talking to folks about their uh, their content or their channel proposals. So fingers crossed we'll see you on the Quasette. Yeah, yeah, I really hope so. I, I'm, I am so ready to get back to travel and, um, and, and always love making it over to Europe. And now it's time for Story of the Week, the TV industry news story that's caught Anthony's eye in the past seven days. What's your Story of the Week, Anthony? Uh, I got to think the Story of the Week, I mean, obviously the biggest TV event happened last night That's uh, for, in the US, that's the Super Bowl. And the reviews and feedback I'm reading on social media and, and my own personal opinion is, uh, the halftime show really was incredible. You know, obviously, I'm a fan of the music. I, uh, you know, grew up uh, um, with Dr. Dre and 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 Snoop Dogg. But I, the one thing I would really thought was incredible was the design of the stage and how it was almost this diorama set. Um, I think there's a British designer that created that name as Devlin and a, a halftime uh, show producer named Bruce Rogers. So I, I, I was really impressed by that. That was my my story of the week. It was super cool and good to see Eminem there as well. We haven't seen him for a little while. 50 Cent was like a uh, unannounced addition. Everybody else was front and center in the promotional material. So I guess that was the little the little surprise is that we got 50, 50 Cent out of uh, out of it as well. And now it's time for Hero of the Week and Get in the Bin. Anthony, who's your Hero of the Week? Well, I mentioned him before. I'm going to throw out uh, uh, British designer S. Devlin and Bruce Rogers uh, for their Super Bowl halftime show uh, design work. I just thought it was incredible. Yeah, well, we'll put a link in the episode description so everyone can go and have a look at that. It was, if you haven't seen it already, I mean, it's right across social media right now. I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll find a link useful. And how about getting in the bin, Anthony? Who or what are you chucking in the bin this week? I was incredibly disturbed by these, the latest Winter Olympics news I read this morning, which was about Russian skater Camilla Valieva. I hope I didn't butcher that too much. The doping tests that she tested positive for, uh, it's just so sad. You know, she's a 15-year-old child, essentially, a minor, Whoever is encouraging the doping of minors is definitely, uh, I, that's, uh, that's my pick. I, I just was like really bothered by that. So I think it's some sort of drug she tested positive for that's for heart disease patients. As you say, 15-year-old girl, I mean, she's just there to, she's obviously an incredibly talented skater and they've just given her the go-ahead to compete in the solo I don't know if that's the right term, but in the solo skating, she's already run the team gold, but I don't believe they're going to be allowed to uh, to award the medals until 
there's a v- various investigation. And the other thing is actually it's not even the Russian team, is it? It's the Russian Olympic Committee team because the Russian team is already banned. Yeah. For uh, for, for doping. Yeah. It's a pretty poor state of affairs, as you say, particularly when it comes to a 15 year old girl. But it just seems to be every time, every Olympics, whether it's summer or winter, there's there's always some sort of doping, isn't there? She's, I mean, she's put in a lot of hard work, it's clear, and she should be able to participate. It, you know, why add insult to injury here? It's just, it's just a bummer to, to see something like the Olympics, which, you know, should be bringing a lot of positive stories to, to see this this morning. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's bothersome. I hope everybody's enjoying the Winter Olympics anyway, the rest of it. I certainly am. It's, uh, I always look forward to the bit of bobsleigh. Anthony, thank you so much for joining us this week from the East Coast. I hope you're wrapped up and you'll be going uh, having a bit of snowball fighting with the kids or whatever this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me, Justin. This was fun. My next guest this week is a regular to Telecast, and she's here to bring us up to date on all the goings on and preparations for what will be for many in the industry one of the first major international markets to take place since the pandemic. Welcome back to Telecast, Director of MIPCOM and MIP TV, Lucy Smith. How are you doing, Lucy? Hello there, Justin. I'm doing very well, thank you. It's good to speak with you again. It's been a while. It has been a while. Are you speaking to us from uh, from Read Me Them uh, headquarters or RX? I think it is now, isn't it, your, your business? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You're right. Yes, I am, I am today at the RX France uh, headquarters here at La Défense in Paris. There's been a few changes, hasn't there, at RX uh, in terms of the the organisation of MIP TV and MIPCOM. Can you tell us a little bit about that? We went to a merger just last year, so with uh, Read Medium and Read Exhibitions France becoming under the single company RX France. And I've been actually given a, a wider remit, so I'm now taken on responsibility for all of the MIP markets and esports via our sister show, which has been, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, exciting changes taking place, and some many of our regular team are in place, and we have some opportunities for some new um, team members joining as we speak. So lots of exciting things happening, which has helped us as we've gone through uh, an incredible. MIPCOM in person, uh, a MIP Cancun in person, and now we're all full steam ahead uh, preparing uh, for MIP TV and eSports Bar that will take place in Cannes this April. All right. Okay. Well, uh, well, congratulations on your your new wider remit, and I'm sure we'll be we'll be seeing in the press, you know, some announcements of some of the new team members. So we'll look forward to seeing that. COVID is becoming less of a threat. And the impact on our lives is, you know, it's uh, much reduced, which must be music to your ears as you know the biggest event producer in uh, in the business how are things going with the preparation then for this year's mip tv things are going really well um justin you're right it's obviously we do feel a lot better about uh, you know the pandemic we feel like we're kind of coming out the other side which i hope many people are feeling and it's obviously all about many more territories opening up and feeling ready to travel and i think that you know this mip tv we can go a bit further than we were able to go at MIPCOM. We feel that it's not just about, you know, being able to come back to Cannes and meet in person. Um, it's also about us um, helping to, you know, navigate and chart the future. Um, we think that, you know, the timing just couldn't be better now. Um, with, as you said, you know, MIP TV will be the first big international market bringing the industry back together for a while. But also it's really, it's the first one for 2022. And it's also the first time that MIP TV will actually have taken place for an unbelievably long three years. We were going through a major transformation of MIP TV, which was meant to be delivered in 2020. And then, of course, due to the pandemic, we had to um, you know, cancel last minute. But this is the first time we'll be back. We'll be delivering on that transformation. We'll be delivering on what we had promised, you know, based on all of that sort of customer feedback, which is to have a really a three-day business efficient market with various changes to the format. So we're really excited to be able to deliver that and use all of those learnings we've had from clients, especially from having put on uh, MIPCOM just last October. You know, being at MIPCOM, uh, we obviously did a show from uh, from MIPCOM and, you know, the feedback was 
from pretty much everybody that I met and, and we had on the show that it was, you know, it was how great it was to be back to doing business face to face and uh, in a slightly more, slightly more relaxed atmosphere but also it gave you that time to catch up with people that you hadn't actually seen for, for a couple of years for those who were at MIPCOM and can envisage what that was like in Riviera 7 and 8 and, and the rest of, of the setup can you give us an idea of, about how MIP TV will differ to that layout of MIPCOM 2021 and actually for those who haven't been to Cannes for a couple of years can you just give us an overview of what delegates can expect to see at MIP TV in 2022? MIP TV uh, will actually follow a very similar pr- footprint to, to MIPCOM. So as you say, for those who um, weren't in Cannes, it would be good to, to remind everyone. So what we um, focused on was concentrating the key market areas. So the key exhibition areas were throughout the the third, fourth and fifth floors of the Palais, the main Palais de Festival building. And then we used Riviera 7, which is, again, these beautiful, big, light and airy exhibition halls as the, the other key stand um, exhibition area. And we used, and we'll use again, the Riviera 8, which some will remember more as the Sea View, which is uh, the beautiful big round hall uh, with a kind of almost a 360 degree views across the the port, the sea, um, the beaches. So it's we were lucky at Cannes in uh, in October because we had beautiful weather. So and let's hope that this April will be lucky again. So m- many open door spaces um, were used. So we we created an event space. We also will have a a big networking lounge space, which we will, for MIP TV, we'll be branding so that our MIP doc audience can um, use the networking space with a, with a created area, MIP formats as well. Um, and obviously all of the MIP TV delegates will use the main auditoriums of the Palais, the big, beautiful Debussy Theatre, which will um, hold some of our very exciting big heavy hitter keynotes that we have lined up, as well as the other key auditoriums in the Palais. We'll have Can series running alongside MIP TV um, using the Grand Auditorium, Louis Lumiere Theatre, with the beautiful big pink carpet set up in front of the main building. What will be new this year is that we are co-locating Esports Bar, uh, which is a sister show that's existed for five years already, we're co-locating that alongside um, MIP TV, which I know we can talk a little bit more about as we move on. There's nothing in any hotels. No, there's no aspect of MIP TV in the hotel. So it's all there within the Palais, essentially in seven and eight, and then in the Debussy in terms of the auditorium. So it's 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 much more compact, but it's it's basically easier to access, essentially. It's much closer to each other. Yeah, no, absolutely. We are using the other auditoriums in the in the Palais, so that's Auditorium A, the new studio that the Palais de Festival created, which is um, was called Estorel, which is now the High uh, Five Studio, which is um, a beautiful uh, new space. The hotels we used uh, before because we had the weekend before the market that would be, uh, you know, always used for uh, MIP Doc, for example, um, as we do at MIP Comp for MIP Junior, which will continue. But we won't be doing that this year because part of delivering on this new three-day business efficient market was to integrate the MIP Doc and MIP formats um, events inside MIP TV because we really felt that the um, we wanted to have a much more um, efficient experience for people with a better return on investment for them. So we've brought it all in together while still delivering many of the key components of those shows. I feel, you know, talking in advance of the event, everyone's like, are you going to MIP TV? Are you going to MIP TV? Who's going? Do you know who's going to be there in terms of, you know, particularly in terms of US companies? Because that's the, that's, I think the trigger for some people is, you know, whether there are any US companies and big US studios coming in. Can you give us a bit of a sense of who's already signed up in terms of exhibitors and and what are the big US companies that we might expect to see on the Croissette this year? You know, I mean, let's just say sort of MIP TV is looking really good. We have over 
uh, 120 exhibitors already signed up and more, many more conversations still ongoing. Um, and they're from more than 50 countries. So when you look at the, you know, exhibitor list, you're looking at companies coming from um, whether it be kids, stock formats or, you know, drama with major studios. Some of the uh, key companies that we can, you know, always good to mention are, um, you know, Bitter Film, Cake, Federation, Media One, uh, MCs, France Television, multiple international groups. You know, you wanted to talk a bit about, uh, particularly about the US uh, studios. From the US studios, we have Viacom, CBS Global Distribution Group, who actually will be coming for the first time that they'll be coming together as one company since the merger between Viacom and CBS. So we know that they'll be, you know, representing drama, but also formats and kids, of course, with Nickelodeon. Warner Brothers, they'll be focusing very much on bringing their unscripted production group, um, Andrew, Andrew Zane's teens. Um, they've taken their beautiful stand on the beach, on the majestic beach, again, for, for MIP TV. Where Lionsgate will be present, and that's the first time they, they'll have been back since the pandemic. Fox Alternative Entertainment is really exciting for us this year because it's their first presence of Fox since the Disney acquisition. And Fox is really, you know, going to become a still a major player internationally across the streaming um, drama production and formats. And they're, they're, they're coming to Cannes with their $100 million unscripted fund, which was really created specifically for them to, to find new formats from across the globe. Um, and they're actually partnering with us on our MIP formats pitch competition this year, which is really good. So um, I know that um, Alison Wallach, the EVP and the head of Fox Alternative Entertainment will be um, will be there. And they just acquired, you know, Mar Vista and last year acquired uh, Tubi as their AVOD streaming platform. So we're expecting them all to be there. And uh, we think that's uh, you know, going to be great for the participants. Um, of MIP TV to here, and Sony will be will be around with a certain presence, and this isn't obviously only about uh, the exhibitors. So Sony um, will be coming. We'll we'll have on stage uh, Wayne Garvey and Jane Tranter, um, which will be the first big sort of opportunity for Sony to present Bad Wolf since the acquisition just uh, uh, the end of last year. Actually, uh, you know they're they're so well positioned as one of the you know biggest drama producers in Europe. Um, but also their their formats production um, group. So we're expecting a delegation of them um, in Cannes as well. So there's lots of really exciting um, participants with the, the the big pavilions are back, Telefilm and Sodec from Canada, um, the European media, um, Creative Media will be there with their um, spaces uh, in the Palais with UniFrance, which is the new TVFI, the French pavilion. Um, Belgium and Austria and Spain and Italy are all present with their pavilions. So many, many great companies will be present uh, at MIPTV. It sounds like you're building up a bit of a head of steam there, Lucy. It sounds like already, are you expecting it to exceed MIPCOM in, in terms of, or MIPCOM 2021, in terms of size? Do you think, you know, uh, uh, as we're a few months ahead, what are we, uh, two months ahead of time right now? Do you do you feel that it's sufficiently building in a in a in in a way that you can expect it to be a uh, a bigger event? And to your point, it sounds like there's there's some actually external exhibition areas as well that's happening. So it so we, it might not just be purely within the palais, but there are stands that are going to be taking place actually on the uh, majestic beach, as you say. Yeah, majestic beach, exactly. Well, I think you know if you compare to to MIPCOM, I think. We're feeling now a little like we felt in those last two weeks of the run up to MIPCOM, where it really did feel like the registrations were coming in every day. Many, many conversations. I mean, some some companies who kind of when we were on deadlines for certain um, needs in um, uh, last month, we're having to say, look, we just don't think we can then be able to come because, you know, they, they needed to sort of book their spaces and now coming back and saying, hey, things are changing we're actually feeling like you know the restrictions are lifting we're hearing so much of a good buzz we're feeling like that positive momentum is bringing you know some of those companies who weren't sure are actually beginning to say actually we do want to be there it does feel very much like it did uh you know those last couple of weeks before MIPCOM so I think we're feeling that I mean MIPCOM was we had around four and a half thousand people attended 
We definitely feel that MIP TV will exceed that based on that really, you know, great momentum that we're seeing and with people who are registering uh, every day with more conversations, got a lot of conversations ongoing about companies wanting to still to take space, whether it be, you know, meeting space. We've always said we have a lot of flexible opportunities for companies to take place. It's not all about, you know, needing to take your, your stand, although obviously that's still a huge part of the event. And that's obviously what many people need. But you can also have You know, there's lounge space areas and, you know, people sending delegations. It definitely feels like we're on to a very positive and hopefully a very strong lit TV. In the last couple of years, obviously, we've seen so many changes across the the TV industry when it comes to streaming and AVOD and SVOD and and lots of other areas. But I think particularly in the last year and even in the last six months, we've seen the metaverse coming over the horizon. And uh, we've seen, you know, these huge developments, you know, Facebook changing their, their, their corporate brand name and lots of other businesses looking to blockchain, looking to also looking to gaming and the and uh, essentially the integration of interactive entertainment and how that's developing. MIP TV is often looked at, you know, those these future trends and brought some great speakers and great content to the event over the years. How is MIP TV addressing the metaverse and gaming in terms of, you know, what, what can we learn from this year's MIP TV in, in, about those new developing technologies? There's two really important areas I'd like to touch upon to respond to that. The first is just to talk a little bit about esports bar and that sort of, you know, the, that that gaming part of the conversation, the part of the question. So we're organising Esports Bar in the Palais along the same dates as MIP TV. Esports Bar, I mean, it's not a bar, I assure you. Bar stands for Business Arena. It's a business networking event that was created, you know, started up five years ago by RX France. There have been shows in Miami and Cannes. um, And we've now decided to bring it alongside MIP TV because we do believe that there are many synergies between the TV and and esports. And some of the kinds of companies that come to that, I mean, we bring together game publishers, um, esports teams, uh, brands, and now, of course, media, because obviously everybody is looking to get to those young, you know, let's call them millennial, millennial audiences. And some of the companies already, you know, coming to that, who I think will be um, very interesting for our, you know, TV participants to me, are companies like Riot Games, one of the biggest um, publishers, Team Liquid, which is run by Claire Hungate, who you've had on your show before, who used to be with Warner in the UK, um, Ubisoft, Pepsi, Media Pro, who's a traditional TV company too. So, that all of these these different um, communities will 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 come together, and there are many subjects that are very relevant to both of those, and that's where we're focusing a lot of our program, or a certain part of our program in any case, about these future trends that we've talked about, um, and that is you know around the metaverse and around um, you know NFTs and um, blockchain. You know, I do think that you know we all need to kind of be in the audience for that, Justin, to kind of work out what it means. I mean, some of the questions we're hearing are sort of, you know, what will NFTs mean for the TV industry? You know, and where does TV fit into this sort of vision of a, the future of, with the metaverse? And that's those are some of the questions we, we're hoping to respond to. I mean, we've got a great presentation from, from Dubit, who's extremely present in this area, which is really talking about, you know, making youth TV brands metaverse ready. Uh, so there's many different ways that we'll address this through sessions, presentations to really answer questions that I think, you know, TV companies um, are really looking to understand more about and also some of our sort of networking and workshop areas. Both of the um, registered participants for MIP TV and eSports Bar can freely participate within each other's um, events. The idea is really to create uh, synergies and opportunities for um, companies um, to meet together. And the more I speak about these areas, whether it be esports or you know the metaverse, NFTs, the more I hear our kind of more let's say traditional you know clients 
really sort of just spontaneously saying, actually, I'm really focusing on this area right now. And there's so much crossover already happening. We really do think that, uh, you know, it's a great area for us to be, you know, delivering on these, these synergies and opportunities for these industries. Thinking about it, an event is actually the ideal format for you to discover a little bit more about uh, these sort of concepts because we've read various articles or we've followed links and gone to, you know, find our own information out on the internet. And actually, sometimes it's not really laid out correctly in a way that you can really understand such a, understand the opportunity. So the, the, the opportunity to actually discover and meet executives who may be able to maybe open your your mind a little bit to the opportunities <laughs> is uh it's a, it's a, it's a good opportunity for for delegates to be able to uh, network and see uh, see how they can potentially change their businesses and adapt their businesses to these new developments yeah no i agree i think it's it's all about you know coming together meeting new people and learning from each other um, and that is absolutely what, you know, we're able to deliver with uh, creating events like this. So how about the rest of the highlights for the event, Lucy? What else can delegates expect to see at this year's MIP TV? Well, I think we've got a lot of really exciting things happening. It's um, We're really bringing some of those great heavy hitters to can. You know, the people in the news who can help us, you know, to talk about the future. So a couple of people we'd already um, I'd had announced already, but I think it's really worth talking about is Kevin Mayer, um, Candle Media, so the you know ex um, head of Disney Plus, and one of the most exciting companies around. And he'll be coming with Rene Reckman, who's the you know amazing sort of co-founder of Moonbug. And um, I think there's a lot of people who are really interested to hear what uh, Candle Media uh, has ahead and um, hear what they've got to talk about. There's um, these are the kinds of people I think you expect to see in a major international can market like MIP. I mentioned uh, Wayne Garvey, Jane Tranter talking about, you know, the ambitions of, um, you know, continuing to grow European uh, drama productions. Uh, Cecil Frock-Coutaz, who's the CEO of Sky Studios, quite recently um, in her new uh, position, is going to be the latest recipient of Variety's International Achievement in Television Award. And we've got a very exciting news coming from Korea where we've got the creators of the hottest show of last year, Squid Game, who are coming over um, for Can Series and uh, MIP TV. Those are some of the exciting kind of like keynote, heavy hitter type of conversations you'll be hearing. And then, of course, there are some of the the highlights that people would expect from a MIP TV. And one I just wanted to to focus on was this MIP drama which is um, we had a record number uh, of entries from it drama this year, which brings in um, new screenings of uh, new dramas in production um, from around the world. And they will be revealing that line up in the, in the coming weeks. And then of course there's MIP formats, MIP doc with their pitches and sessions and the Frapper summit. And there's so much going on. It's going to be such a busy three days. I think everyone will be, um, have plenty to to learn about and uh, many um, you know networking opportunities to enjoy and all we need now is the sunshine Lucy that's <laughs> it that's you know let's hope for that, that sun shining on the croissant and you know we can we can all enjoy uh, getting back together again finally oh I do hope so and you could I, I just cannot when I think back to the, that beautiful sunshine we had at MIPCOM and how excited everyone was to get back together, I think that I don't think I've ever heard so many people call me to say, I wish I had gone and they haven't made it there. So I think that kind of fear of missing out, um, let's hope that people can avoid it this time and they will be able to join us in Cannes for MIP TV in the sun. And now it's time for Story of the Week, the TV industry news story that's caught Lucy's eye in the past seven days. What's your Story of the Week, Lucy? Um, the story of the week, actually, is from Variety, and it's about the gaming giants like Activision, Blizzard and Riot betting on esports TV prospects. And they really are calling esports as the, the biggest opportunity that nobody's talking about yet. Um, and given, you know, our crossover of esports and MIP TV, we thought I thought that was a very sort of insightful uh, piece of news and uh, looks like we really are sort of on a, on a real trend here. So um, I think that it really focused on the 
existing esports rights deals for the likes of, you know, Call of Duty League with Google. And I think that, you know, what's been happening over the past two years, you know, we've talked obviously a lot about the pandemic and how that's impacted things. I mean, the, 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 the rise in, uh, you know, what's been happening with the number of casual gamers and the, you know, eyeballs on, on watching esports has been huge. So I think that would, that really did sort of catch my eye as something that was very relevant to uh, what we feel is uh, happening in the industry right now. It is definitely merging with Activision have, having been bought by Microsoft and and we're seeing that all of these, um, everybody moving, as we were talking about earlier on, to around the, the metaverse and gaming. And it's, it's a really exciting time. So hopefully we're going to learn a little bit more in Cannes in April about all of that. Lucy, thank you so much for coming on the show and telling us what to expect at MIP TV in 2022. All remains to be said is I'll uh, I'll see you on the Crasset for a for a rosé in a in a few weeks time. <laughs> you certainly will, Justin. I can't wait, and we'll look forward to welcoming you back for your next podcast series of telecasting. Can I hope? Absolutely, look forward to it. Thanks, Lucy. All the best with your final preparations for the event. Well, we've reached the end of another telecast. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to the show and share it with friends and colleagues. We've got a brand new website that includes exclusive feature content from TV's opinion leaders and journalists. They're all free to access. Just sign up at telecast.com. And while you're there, why not sign up for our free newsletter, Telecast Plus? You can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter. As always, Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in London. Until next week's show, as always, stay safe.